let's do this as we always do with the Bridge Club. If everyone will raise their glass, we're going to have Dr. Sheen to go ahead and start with our opening toast. Yeah, so uh, here's to all of our faithful companions, whether they be furry, feathered, or scaled, to the love that they give us and the love that we receive from them, to those we cherish today and those that have passed on but live on in our hearts. We are so blessed to have known you. Cheers. Cheers. So Dr. Sheen, because I did not do a proper introduction of you, other than I've got a couple of questions about how you got into the field the way you did. Can you give us just some basic background so people can see how wickedly cool you are? Yeah. <laughs> That'd be amazing. Of course. This is, yes, brag on yourself, please. <laughs> okay, yeah. Um, I'm originally from Texas, so I'm a Southern girl. Um, I went to vet school at Texas a and I graduated in 2013. Uh, after graduation, I went into small animal general practice, which is where I've been in uh, since I joined Fuzzy a couple years ago. Uh, while in practice, I was looking for more integrative ways that I could help my pet patients, especially those senior pets, because they are um, my, my focus and my passion. And so I had additional training and certification in acupuncture, uh, chiropractic therapy uh, called spinal manipulation in pets. Um, advanced pain management and hospice and palliative care. So helping uh, guide families through that end of life decision is, is one of the things that really brings me um, good satisfaction in, in the profession. It's just something I love to do. So clearly a lot of experience, not like a little, just like a ton. So this is going to be amazing for us to, to really dive into it. You know, she and I had the great opportunity to talk with one another in advance. And I was surprised when she said, her favorite patients to work with are aging pets. Can you die? Like, tell us a little bit more about that because a lot of people go, no, the puppies, the kittens, the, you know, all the littles tell us yeah. why aging pets are what draw you. Yeah. You know what I think uh, about senior pets, what I have experienced in my clinical uh, clinical years is that the bond between a senior pet and their people is really the, the full expression of what the human animal bond can be because they've spent so many years together, getting to know each other, living life experiences together, that to see the connection that they have and, and the deep knowing um, on both sides, I think is just something that's really beautiful. Uh, people come to me when they reach that, that end stage of life and, and are questioning whether you know, it's time for their pet. And they'll tell me, you know, I've had this cat since before I had kids, or you know, this dog has gotten me through the loss of a loved one, or these big life changes, marriages, divorces, all those things. They've been there with us through all of that. And I just think it's, um, it's a beautiful thing to be a witness to and, and to help support them um, during a time that, that can be sad, but can also be really wonderful. Okay, um, I just right there. I just feel like I can completely <laughs> cry right now. I just think that was beautiful and kind. Yeah. And again, I think um, pet parents are very lucky to have you in this profession because that's absolutely yeah. incredible. I well, do. And there's sorry, Catherine. There's a lot we can do too. That I think that's the other part that I really love is that we can make a big difference on the veterinary side of things for senior pets. So you know, a dog can come in. They've been limping. They're not able to enjoy life like they have been before. We can start them on something as simple as an anti-inflammatory and they'll come back a month later and it's like they've gotten their dog back. So I think, you know, there's a lot, a lot we can do, which we'll talk about today um, to really make their lives much, uh, much better um, with just really simple interventions. Sorry to catch up. Go ahead. Incredible, incredible, incredible. So Shannon's going to be putting some links in as we're also talking uh, this afternoon, uh, I'm, this evening, I should say, uh, to be able to help uh, inform our conversation a little bit more. So, you know, senior pets and their ages vary by breed, but how do we kind of understand when a pet is a senior pet? Because Lily is 13, but someone who has a, you know, um, a German Shepherd or may have um, a Labrador, their dogs have a different senior age group. So how do we define senior? Yeah, so senior is generally speaking, the last 25% of their expected lifespan. Um, so pretty straightforward for cats, you know, they, they kind of generally have the same amount of lifespan. And so for cats, we're looking at kind of the 11 to 12 year range. Um, but you're exactly right with dogs, it varies a lot. So for a 
giant breed like a Great Dane that can happen as early as six or seven years of age. Um, you know, a lab more in the eight to nine year range. And for those really small dogs, you know, again, in that kind of 11 to 12. So, um, you know, at 13, uh, definitely in, in the senior stage. So, you know, I think a lot of, uh, a lot of this information will be helpful to those who might not uh, realize that their pets are, are in that senior stage just yet. So you talked about veterinarians and uh, medical teams can do a lot early on to be helpful being manage the quality of life for a pet. Can you dive into what are key signs that pet owners should be looking for that we may overlook or not realize? And we may use the statement, because I have, you know, she's just getting older. Yeah. Uh, what I like to say is that, you know, change is inevitable, but debilitation doesn't have to be. So we don't have to get to a point at which uh, we're experiencing a loss of quality of life because of these issues. And, and particularly if we can intervene early because they're degenerative changes, they get worse over time. There are things we can do as it gets to those later stages, but if we can slow it down on the front end, we can um, push off those interventions much later. The three things where we typically see changes in older pets are gonna be, uh, the one I, I hear a lot is mobility changes. So you know, hey doc, my, my dog's just slowing down. Uh, difficulty getting up from laying down or kind of thinking about it before, uh, or getting up, yeah, before they're laying down, kind of thinking about it or just kind of collapsing kind of a, you know, as they go down. Um, so don't have the, the uh, muscle stability to be able to just slowly lower themselves like they used to. They may limp when they get up and kind of warm out of that. That's a pretty classic sign of arthritis. Or if you go out and have a big day, the next day they may be really sore. All of those are indications that we're having some joint changes and probably need to think about doing some interventions at that point if we're starting to see them, you know, kind of lag behind on walks or, or have any of those other signs I mentioned. Um, one of the other changes we see is, you know, can't hear or see as well. Um, you know, that's really common. Um, there are degenerative changes that happen in the eyes and primarily those are gonna affect just night vision. Um, so, you know, normally they don't go blind from those changes unless there are cataracts, which is more rare, but just that, that lenticular sclerosis, that change to the lens where you look at the eye and it kind of is not black there in the center. It's a little bit more cloudy or white. Um, those are typically gonna be just age-related change. And what uh, that affects is the depth perception in low light conditions. So they may be really hesitant to jump on the couch like they used to. Um, they may be really cautious on stairs and things like that. They just don't have the confidence they used to. Um, they might not you know, hear as well. They'll, they'll of course still hear when you open the treat bag. Uh, that seems to always be intact. Um, but you know, some other things, they, they may not hear your, um, your calls when you call them in. You know, those kinds of things definitely happen. And then uh, the final thing is, is mental changes. So, you know, being um, maybe early stages of dementia, so more disoriented, uh, staring off into space, uh, waking up at nighttime and being kind of more anxious in general, more clingy in general. Uh, those can all be early signs of some changes mentally as they age as well. That's a, like brilliant. So first of all, I had no idea that when you do see an animal just drop because, and you do, they do that. <sighs> I had no idea that that was actually a, a key mobility sign because you see a lot of animals do that. They're just like so grateful. And it's, it's kind of like me after a long walk and I just fall into the couch. Yeah, and, and some do it normally. If it's a new change, that's kind of where we see it. And they'll kind of, you know, walk around a few times and then they'll think about laying down. And then, you know, finally they'll just kind of give up and do it. Um, it's that kind of just hesitation to lay down because they know it's going to be a little bit sore. Or they don't have that muscle strength to be able to do that in a coordinated way. So let's talk about how to address some of those, because when you were going through these, all I kept thinking about is we as, as pet parents and caregivers, right? So we are their caregivers. We tend to modify things without realizing we're modifying them. And so does that mean it's probably progressed by the time we've started to modify things, does that mean it's progressed too far for you to help or what can be done to begin to help? Yeah, you know, there's there's really not a point at which we don't have anything we can do. There's always a point at which we can help in some way. 
Um, but you're exactly right. Those early interventions specifically for arthritis are gonna be uh, supplements. So easy enough to do something you don't need a prescription for. The one that's gonna be most helpful for arthritis and that has the most research behind it is gonna be fish oil supplements. Uh, fish oil is an anti-inflammatory component, those omega fatty acids. Um, not only does it have benefits for the joint health, but for skin and coat health, um, for heart health. So there's lots of, of benefits to giving it and very few side effects, which you can say uh, much of, of uh, things have those qualities. So that's something really easy to start early on when your pet becomes that senior age range. Just go ahead and get them on fish oils. Um, the other thing we want to think about as things progress is environmental modifications. So a lot of us have those beautiful hardwood floors, those laminate floors, I have them myself, and you'll start to see that your dog will kind of walk on them like they're walking on a, an ice rink with regular shoes, you know, you see them just kind of really slip out. And what we want to prevent is falls, just like we do for older people. We want to try to make an environment where they can have confidence walking around their environment. They feel like they've got traction because when they fall, then we've got some muscle soreness on top of their joint soreness. Um, and so it makes it more difficult to control pain when that happens. Um, so things like looking around your environment for stairs, uh, putting, you know, there are uh, friction tapes, little kind of like skateboard material tape that you can get at the hardware store and put on your stairs so that they have that nice solid footing. You can put down rug runners or even yoga mats cut to size in certain areas so they have pathways that they can walk through. Um, there are products that you can put on the bottom of paws specifically for dogs um, where you just kind of dip it into this sandy material and it'll stay for several days and provide kind of that nice traction yeah. surface like little sneakers on their feet. Um, called Paw Friction. I, I uh, provided a little link to what that looks like. Um, but there's lots of products like that where we can uh, just modify things a little bit to make it easier for them to get around and navigate their environment and do so with, with more confidence and, and less injury. So a couple questions. So I, I want to go back to the supplements because this always is an interesting topic. So fish oil in particular, and JJ, we'll get to yours in a second, because I was more concerned about, do you need to make sure you're talking to your veterinary and medical team to ensure that you should be using fish oil? Or do we just willy nilly just start? I, I don't mean to be willy nilly. That was kind of inappropriate. But you know what I'm saying of like, yeah, okay, for us to just start doing it. Yeah, you know, of course, always best to check with your vet, um, but fish oil, as far as the risks go, pretty low. Um, when you're on high levels of fish oil, you can't, so if you overdo it, you can see a little bit of diarrhea because they're going to have a lot of fat in that uh, digestive tract. And so you, you might see that if you see that you back off. There's a small risk of increased bleeding um, with high levels of fish oil, uh, unless there is a, an underlying bleeding disorder generally that's negligible. Um, but again, always best to check, uh, but it, it's pretty benign as far as supplements go um, and generally recognized as safe. Okay. So then JJ had a great question. So if you are going to go ahead and start giving fish oil, is there a measurement based on the dog's weight that you should be giving? And then I have a stupid question. Do you have to crack it open? Like, how do you give fish oil? Like, are you yeah. in the adult fish oils? I'm thinking the capsules. So I just kind of need a little guidance here. Absolutely. So any product you buy, uh, especially if it's made for pets, um, is going to have the dosing instructions there. So you won't have to do any calculations. Uh, it comes in a couple forms. So it comes in a capsule. Um, like you said, those can be quite large. So for smaller pets, you certainly can open them up and just pour them over food. Most dogs like that fishy taste, that fishy smell. If you've got a picky one, you might keep it in the capsule and uh, put a little bit of something tasty around it um, to help it, it down a little bit. Uh, but there are liquid formulations as well. So if you don't want to have to be, you know, poking capsules and messing with that, you can um, just use something uh, just squeeze onto the food is really the easiest way to do it. Now, are there any other supplements that we should also be thinking about as well for our pets as they age? Yeah, so there are some, there are quite a few different supplements out there. Um, one that's talked about a lot is glucosamine and chondroitin. And the, the jury's still out on that. Um, from the research that I've read, uh, some studies say it helps, some say it does nothing. It's not gonna be harmful. Um, and there are anecdotal reports that it helps, but if you're really gonna spend your money somewhere, I think that fish oil gives you your better bang for the buck. There are some other things that can be included in those glucosamine and chondroitin supplements though, things like MSN, MSM and uh, green lip muscle, which can have been shown to improve joint function. 
So a nice combination product like uh, Nutramax makes one called Desiquin, which is really nice um, and has a lot of those components in it. Uh, so those would be my typical go-tos is something like a uh, Desiquin with a fish oil supplement is gives you a kind of good base supplement wise without overdoing it. So is there anything for the cognitive and the eyesight as you were kind of going through some of those, you know, if we're talking about the mobility and the mental state, is there any supplements that help with those as well? Yeah. So with the, the mental changes, what we're trying to utilize with supplements is antioxidants. So we've probably heard a lot about that for our own health. What antioxidants are doing is they're scavenging free radicals. Those are these things in our bodies that causes inflammation, that causes breakdown. And so these antioxidants basically uh, squash those and remove them from the system. So when we think about antioxidants for ourselves, we think about blueberries, raspberries, you know, maybe even uh, wine that may have some antioxidant properties uh, for all of these, uh, these sipping on that. Um, but for dogs, uh, there is a specific supplement called Senalife, um, and that has a good mix of antioxidants in it that help to uh, slow that damage down. And it's actually been shown to be almost as effective as the prescription medication for dementia in dogs. And so it's wow. a great one to add. Um, it can even counteract some of those early signs of dementia. Um, so something as you start to see those really consider adding into the mix. And Shannon, I haven't been watching very closely. I just saw the one. Is there any others on the supplements that we should be bringing forth for everybody? And then we'll... Yeah, I think I've got one for Senalife uh, on there, um, that dementia supplement. Um, the the Dasequin I didn't include, so we, we could look that up and add okay. that. Yeah, but okay. yeah, else? nothing else like supplement specific right now. There's a few others that I think we'll get to as we go. Otherwise, well, I'm break. kind of intrigued by this cold laser therapy. Trust me, we're going to get to the questions on end of life stuff here in a moment, but I want to make sure on the therapy side, we're pushing that part forward. So what's the cold laser therapy? Yeah. So uh, laser is something I've used a lot in my uh, rehabilitation. Um, it's basically a, a wavelength of light that excites the photons, those um, energy producing uh things in our cells, and they um, help decrease inflammation in a way that that's non-invasive, that uh, it's used for wound management, so it helps with skin healing, um, but we use it for uh, arthritis in particular with, with good results. You do have to do it um, fairly regularly to start, so, you know, maybe two to three times a week until you get things kind of in a nice state, and then you can decrease that to weekly or, or every other week or, or even monthly in some cases, but it can penetrate the skin and get down into that joint and really help at the site of the pain to help relieve pain, relieve inflammation and swelling. It's, um, it's pretty amazing. Yeah, I've used it a lot. So I know this is not on anything we talked about, but it just only popped in my head when she brought up the cold therapy. What about red light therapy? Is, that, is there any studies been done on that with helping with aging pets at all? So um, any of these uh, red light therapy is going to be a form of lasers just to do. Oh, it is. Thing. Okay. I didn't, see, um, I didn't know yeah. That. <laughs> the, the, the red light therapy is going to be um, a less powerful than some of the machines that like your veterinarian or your rehab specialist would utilize. There are some over, over the counter options and they, they may still work. Um, what's the difference is, is the time that it has to be on. Um, so for some of those, you know, you have to leave it on for, you know, 10 or 15 minutes, maybe even up to 30 minutes at a time to really get the amount of energy in that area that you want. Um, so it, it is definitely a, a potential for, for home use, but you want to get one that, you know, has verified that, that it does what it says it does. Um, Cause it's, it's a little bit of a wild west out there, regulatorily speaking. So um, good to, to buy from a, a trusted company, somebody that's done the research around it. So before we move into the big topic, which is, you know, as our pets are aging and, and understanding the need for palliative care, you know, is another signal the amount of sleeping or is that not, or just in general? I'm curious about like the total number of hours of a pet sleeping and if that's a starting to be a signal on extra care that might be needed. Yeah, I don't typically think of, of sleeping as a concerning sign. We know that older pets sleep more. They have a lot um, you know, more body work that needs to happen of uh, healing their muscles and rebuilding and things. Um, and just generally, you know, older people too, I think sleep, sleep more. It's just, you know, why not relax in your, your older age? 
Um, where I do see concerns about it is if, you know, when they're awake, they're more lethargic and, you know, not interactive. If that sleeping is interfering with their ability to enjoy their daily activities, if you're noticing that along with those mobility changes, it can uh, lead us to believe that there may be pain present because they just don't want to get up. They don't want to move because they know it's going to be uncomfortable. If they're otherwise, when they're awake, they're happy running around, you know, or, or doing their normal activity. I'm not as worried about it. Uh, but when it's paired with some of those mobility changes, it, it can signal that there's a, a pain component that they just you know don't want to get up and move around because it, it's too painful. So let's let's go into this notion of understanding the quality of life and when those are being hindered. You know, when we talk about the important factors of seeing if something is happening, you know, how do we know that their quality of life is being hindered? That we are that we now need to potentially be looking at palliative care? Because I believe we, there's a card or a tracker that we should be using. So there are a variety of different quality of life scales. And what they're trying to do is take a look at all the aspects of what uh, constitutes a pet's life that brings them joy or that causes them stress and distress and say, how do we weigh these together to say, hey, is, is their distress, is their pain more significant than the joy that they find in life? Um, there are scales that utilize point systems to figure that out. And if you're a numbers person, that might be helpful. Um, but there are, you know, more qualitative ways to think about it. So sometimes we say, you know, think of five things your pet really loves to do. And when they can no longer do two or three of those, you know, maybe that's a point at which their quality of life has really decreased. You know, there are some pets that like a lab. Um, they're going to eat no matter what's going on. Um, they'll they'll eat till the end. Uh, you know, so you, you can't necessarily say that you know if a, a pet is is eating that they're feeling fine. Um, you know, if they're not able to be interactive with the family to enjoy those activities that they want to do, if they are experiencing pain or distress from their conditions, or if they've been diagnosed with a life limiting condition, so a, a cancer uh, that that's likely to spread, or you know. Um, kidney disease or, or these types of things where we know that we're in a period where uh, we want to think about, you know, time may be more limited. And in that time, how do we increase their enjoyment of life? And, and that's what palliative care is about. What I love about it is that we can really get creative where previously we might have said, gosh, I'm really worried about having you on an anti-inflammatory every day forever because there can be long-term consequences. When we get to that point, we might say, you know, we're not as worried about the long-term consequences. We're worried about how they're feeling today. Um, and we know with certain conditions like kidney disease, they're going to feel nauseous as we get to those end stages. Can we provide an owner with anti-nausea medication to have on hand, talk to them about what nausea looks like and make sure we're proactive about symptom management, that we're not just reactive or letting them get to a point where they're feeling really uncomfortable, but that we're able to intervene earlier. Um, so part of the work that I do with hospice is when we do encounter a life-limiting disease, we talk about what that trajectory might look like. You know, we may have good and bad days where we may be doing fine, and then all of a sudden we're going to see a really steep decline in our quality of life. And that, I think, prepares owners to, to walk that journey with their pet, to know what to expect, to be empowered with information and even with, you know, medication or products or, or things that they can do at home um, to help keep their pet as, as happy for as long as possible, not trying to cheat death or, or say that's not going to happen, but to say, let's make every day as good as we can for whatever time that we have left together. One of the things that I loved about our conversation that we had is you did put the pet owner pretty solidly center in the care for palliative care. And you did talk about that transitioning of towards end of life and having those kind of conversations. But you also talked about some of the challenges that pet owners can face uh, with uh, grief, et cetera, prior to the passing of their pets. So can you dive into that? And then I'd like to talk about what pet owners can also do to make those last days even better uh, for yeah. their pets. So can you talk a little bit about anticipatory grief? Yeah, so, you know, there are, are known reactions that we have that are, are completely normal, but when you're experiencing them for the first time, they can feel really scary. So when you get a diagnosis like that, or, or you're getting to the point where you're seeing changes in your pet and you're feeling like their quality of life may be decreased, um, you start to feel that loss before it happens. You have anticipatory grief, you know that loss is coming and you feel some of that even while they're still with you. Um, and that can be really difficult to work through. 
Um, you know, of course, after the pet passes, there's a lot of, of grief and there can be complex feelings. Uh, guilt is a really common one. Um, you know, did I do this too early? Did I do this too late? And what I would love for, for you guys all to know is that there comes a point in, in your pet's life where there's, there's a period of time that euthanasia is an appropriate decision. And there's not going to be one day that this is the day, this is the perfect day, you know, we chose the time. I, I think that puts too much pressure uh, to, to say, you know, I have to take all these things in and I have to make the decision alone. Know that your veterinarian is a partner in that process, that we've been through that ourselves and with other, other people in our, um, in our work. And so we can help walk you through that. I think that's part of what I love too about hospice is it's not just about the pet, it's about the family and helping everyone from you know, children to, to older people understand their own emotions to normalize them and, and let them know a lot of people feel the way that you feel and, and that's normal and it's okay to feel whatever it is that you feel. There are people that can support you through that and it, it's a journey, it, it comes in waves. Um, you know, when you, you lose a pet, you feel that grief and it, it comes um, and it goes, but little things will remind you and bring that back up and that's just part of the healing process. It's, completely normal. I just love that you are taking such care to, to help guide us pet parents. Cause you know, as you said, there's no love like a love with a senior pet. So I definitely mm -hmm. love that. You and I also talked about something that I never thought of before. And I thought it was so beautiful about creating a bucket list. Can you talk? Yes, absolutely. Um, so as we get to that end stage, you know, um, and we're thinking, you know, quality of life may be decreasing, we may be getting close, it can be kind of a fun exercise to think together, what do I want to experience with my pet before I say goodbye? You know, and maybe that's something as simple as going to a favorite spot, you know, taking a, a picture or a video of you guys together. Um, you know, if they love to play ball, maybe they can't go fetch it, but maybe you can roll it to them um, side to side. I had a, a golden retriever who was diagnosed with cancer. And when it got close to the end, we went to Costco and bought a huge Costco box of tennis balls. And we took him out to the park and we just threw them all up at once and videotaped his reaction, which is just running to every ball and picking up every single one, trying to play with it. Um, it's a beautiful memory. And so because you're nearing that end stage of life, it doesn't have to be the end of good times. It can be a time where each uh, each experience you create together is something that you just really savor and be present in and understand, you know, how special it is that you still do have that time together. Um, not to, to focus as much on, on the loss, but still on the, the times that you can create together. I just think, I think that was the most beautiful thing. And I, you know, I started it, after you and I spoke, I started going, well, what would be on Lily's bucket list? Like you, you sometimes you don't know, yeah. you know, as, as you're kind of going through it. So I have some logistics things that I kind of do want to understand a little bit better. So I've heard of this thing called at home, you know, palliative care, or like people will then just in order to put their pet down, they go into the, the clinic. What is the difference? How does that work? How do we know? to find out if we can get access to something like that or if our practice has it? Yeah, so I've done uh, that type of work um, and more and more places are have veterinarians who that is the primary thing that they do uh, is walk people in the home through, through that process and help their pet pass peacefully in a place that they're comfortable. There's no right or wrong answer when it comes to that. Some people prefer not to do that at home. They don't want that uh, net, you know, what they perceive to be a negative experience to happen in their home. But it's, uh, and, and for those people, the veterinary office is, is great. They do a great job there, but it can be a, a stressful place for some pets. And so in some instances, having that process take place at home where they're comfortable, where the smells are, are familiar to them, surrounded by their people and, and maybe even other pets in the home um, can really be a wonderful experience uh, for everyone to see them Relax. So usually we'll administer a, a, a sedative before giving the injection to help them pass. And so you'll see them just kind of relax into their bed um, and a really, you know, lovely passing in a place that they feel most comfortable um, and aren't, aren't nervous or scared at all. So it's, um, it, it is a service a lot of places are offering. And what you can do is, is search for home euthanasia in your area. Um, most places, uh, sometimes even clinics will provide that service 
um, just for that. We'll come to your house just for that. But there are services that do only that um, and do a really great job at it. So backing up just a little bit, and then I'll pop it over to you, Shannon, if there's any questions. But one of the things that I would love for you to do is, you know, so obviously, you know, we've got Newton who has an 11 year old dog. We've got Pat, we've got all of us that have older dogs or cats. Um, and one of the things that I'd like to know is as we go into the veterinary uh, office for checkups, things of that nature, are there questions we should be asking in, not as though something is wrong right now, but should we be preparing ourselves for what is going to happen down the road? Is there things that we should be asking now that we wouldn't even know to ask? I, I'm just curious. Yeah, so I think, you know, sharing maybe your concerns, anything that you're seeing that's changing, um, particularly in those areas we talked about. So mobility changes, uh, hearing and vision changes, uh, cognitive changes, so dementia changes, and even um, dental health, I think is something we don't really think about for older pets, but a lot of people get really nervous about putting their pets under when they're older. And so trying to intervene with dental health really early on to prevent us getting to that point where we're kind of between a rock and a hard place. We've got a really ouchy mouth and we have to decide you know, do we want to move forward with that or not? So toothbrushing, you know, getting that started as soon as you can, I think is really a, a good thing to do. But asking your vet, you know, how does my pet, how do my pet's joints feel? You know, when they're doing their exam, they are uh, looking at joint flexibility, joint range of motion, you know, are you seeing any restriction? Uh, because that can start to indicate, you know, I can feel that on exam. If I'm not feeling that go all the way back, like it should, it's stopping too soon. I know when I feel that, that there's some arthritis change going on, but it, it may not be something we talk about. I may mention it, but it might not come across that, hey, this is arthritis starting to brew. Um, the other thing is keeping your pet at a really healthy weight, even maybe a little bit leaner than you think they need to be, because that weight will add extra pressure on their joints. And so if we can keep them nice and lean, those joints have a, a, the ability to go on a little bit longer too. So checking in on, hey, what do you think of my pet's weight? I think us as veterinarians are, are a little bit nervous sometimes about talking about weight because <laughs> it's such a delicate topic. Um, but, you know, asking like, where is my pet stand and is there anything that I should be doing differently to help them at this point to try to prevent some of these things? So one of the things I guess I would highly encourage also pet owners to do, and I got fortunate, it happened to me without me asking, was I was in uh, my veterinary hospital and the veterinarian came to me and he said, do you remember when you first brought Lily in and it was really expensive because you had to pay for all the, the, all the shots and all the things and everything was happening. And he says, and then, then he got lucky and it kind of kind of leveled off there for a while because she was just living her best life. And he says, well, that's coming to an end. <laughs> mm -hmm. And he said, so financially preparing for what is going to be potentially coming down uh, the pike. He said, I'm just giving you a heads up. Things are, we're going to have to run more tests as we're doing it. So I really appreciated the candor of saying these are things that we need to be looking out for as we're looking ahead and not doing it on that day. Hey, by the way, today's the day we're going to, you know, have all the tests, but instead this is coming as a, yeah. you know, well cared for pet parent, want to make sure that you are aware. So I do highly encourage people too, as well, to understand, you know, the financial costs that are associated with it. We did have a dental question, Shannon, did we not? We did. I have a couple. Um, so yeah, the one we were saying, mentioning about ouchy mouths and stuff, someone had mentioned, and forgive me, I didn't write the age of the pet, but I think it was a 15 year old dog that has a bad mouth, but the reg vet is concerned about doing a dental because the pet has some other health concerns. So I did sort of address it in the chat, but if you want to add to it, that's fine. Yeah, you know, it's it's a tough decision at, at some point sometimes, and it depends on what those underlying conditions are. Some of, uh, some of the things we can do, we can proceed with anesthesia by taking extra precautions in some cases. Mm -hmm. In some cases, those conditions may be too far along to, to do that. And in that case, you know, we can try to do a little bit of brushing at home. Once that dental disease is really in there, it starts to become uncomfortable to brush too, because we've got all that uh, infection is actually underneath the surface of those teeth. So it's nearby the roots. And so um, there's not much you can do to really get under there other than going in and, and taking those rotten teeth out. So sometimes we'll do, 
you know, pain medications to get them through. But at some point too, if it gets really uncomfortable, you know, we have to kind of make those risk benefit calculations and say, is there a way that we can make anesthesia safe and really get this taken care of? If you are still able to get a, a dental procedure done on your pet, if your pet is healthy enough, once we've got that all cleaned up, that's really the time to get started on that at-home care, that brushing ideally every day, but at least three times a week to see a benefit, um, to keep them that nice clean white and when they come out of that dental procedure and to try to avoid that progression. I love that. Yeah. We did have someone to want to know, um, can you repeat the name of the supplement that you mentioned for like canine dementia? Yeah, it's called Senolife. Um, okay. So I'll just put it there in the chat. So, um, and I, I thought I saw, um, someone talking about their, their pet getting stuck behind the couch. Was that yes. Just, yes. Yes. That yes. An older dog that goes behind the couch and then whines for the pet parents to take, take them out. Yeah, that can definitely be a, an indicator, uh, potentially of dementia. Um, it's really common for them to kind of get stuck. I've seen them under tables um, and they just kind of get confused about where they are and then, you know, just kind of cry for help because they don't know how to get out. Um, so that that can be an early sign of, of some changes with brain function. And then the other things, I think we just had had some people kind of comment, we've mostly been focusing on dogs with a lot of these things, but do these apply to our cat friends or we've got a lot of people with bunnies and guinea pigs and kind of the atypical or like little pocket pets. So yeah, be for those um, little guys? You know, cats especially do have arthritis and their signs can be really subtle. Um, so they're a little bit harder to identify. The things that you might see is that they're less likely to jump up as high as they used to. So where they may have had this nice perch that they love to lay on, they may not be able to get up there as much or they may choose a lower perch instead. So we can help by modifying the environment for those kitties by providing extra steps along the way so that they can still get up there where they like to uh, sit on their throne and, and survey their, their landscape. Um, and uh, the other thing you might see is a change in their ability to go upstairs. So rather than going up, you know, just moving on up, they may take extra steps, kind of sidestep up steps. Um, so you may start to see some changes there where they're just not as spry as they used to be. Um, there are uh, supplements for cats for joint health. Um, they can also take fish oil, great option for them. Um, they don't have as many great uh, options for long-term pain medic medications in regards to anti-inflammatories, but there are new products coming out, uh, injectable medications that last a month um, that they can be administered at the hospital and, and that have shown great improvement. Same with uh, laser therapy and other things like that. That's a really nice, um, you know, painless way to address pain in cats. So we definitely some of the, see some of those same changes. Um, I'm not sure that we recognize as much dementia in cats um, as we do in dogs, but it, it certainly happens. Um, things you want to watch for with cats is a lot of increased vocalization um, that can indicate distress um, and potentially some thyroid issues. So always good if you start to see them, you know, really walking around. Um, weight loss is something you really want to watch for in cats, unexpected weight loss. Uh, because that can indicate some chronic diseases that happen in kitties. And that's, that's blood work and urine testing time as well, if you start to notice any of those changes. So I've got the good question about, you know, bunnies and guinea pigs, you know, what signs do they show that they are, while they are older, I am just kind of curious, what, what kind of signs do they show? I have to honestly say I've never treated a bunny or guinea pig in my veterinary career. I am cat and dog only vet. Um, so I, I will leave that to other experts. Um, I imagine they experience the same changes and, and likely decreased activity levels, but I, I can't honestly say um, I would be able to tell you the common symptoms that they see. Um, I, I just don't see them. We forgive you. We forgive yeah, you. Thank you. There is a question <laughs> sorry, too sorry about bunny and guinea pig only. what about a kitty that has feline leukemia who is doing well um, otherwise, but anything specific to, to cats with those kind of issues as they age? Yeah, you know, feline leukemia, uh, cats with feline leukemia can live uh, long lives, but their immune system is affected. So they're not as, as able to fight off infections. Um, you know, they're more susceptible to, to getting disease. And so uh, there are supplements to improve uh, immune function in kitties to help support them. 
Um, one I'm thinking of in particular, I'll put in the chat called Imiquin. It's by Nutramax as well, a little powder that has immune support uh, function. So um, that would be one I would suggest in, in fish oil. Again, I'm, I guess I'm just the uh, preacher for fish oil, but I, I think there's a great uh, benefit to inflammation control for uh, leukemia kitties as well. Any other questions as we're going through? I first have to just say, you can totally tell she does this for a living, not only from the perspective on the topic, but she's also simultaneously working the chat as she's having <laughs> the conversation. And I'm beyond thoroughly impressed as it's kind of going along. So sometimes there are people who can do both and some who cannot, I'm always completely and utterly fascinated. But Dr. Sheen, before we do our closing toast and do our thank yous, of when you take in calls specifically about, you know, managing the quality of life for an aging pet, is there a question we haven't asked you that we should have asked you or that is a common question that comes forward? You know, one thing I just wanted to mention is as we see a decrease in the, the vision and the hearing senses for our, our older pets, what they still have is their amazing ability to smell. And I don't think that we fully appreciate that dogs and cats, but dogs particularly, experience their world through smell. And so as we go on walks with older pets, what I like to say is, is take them on a snafari. Take them out there and don't be worried about the destination. Think about the journey. Let them kind of wander off and get the sense, um, you know, and, and because it's really kind of a, a Sudoku puzzle for dogs. It keeps their brain really fresh to, to see, experience new sense and, and make uh, new connections that way. So get them out to new places, new things to smell, bring those indoors, you know, do some of those enrichment games. So hide little pieces of food around and let them find it with their sniffer. Um, you know, working through all of those things is really beneficial for their brain and is a lot of fun to watch. Um, so I really encourage people to, to see the world like their pet does, which is, is scent. And I don't think ours is so poor compared to theirs that I think, you know, we don't even think about it. But I read once, you know, we think about a hamburger, you can smell it, you know, smell and appreciate a hamburger, but a dog can smell the, the lettuce and the tomato and the ketchup and the bun, you know, they can really differentiate. And so their world is, is so much wrapped up in that. I think that as older pets, we can do a lot to bring uh, light to their world through those things, especially as their other senses go. I just, I just think that is, uh, you know, a sniffari. I'm going to totally steal that, but I will give you total credit on that. I'm sure it's probably- Oh, it's not mine either. Some, I'm, I'm but someone's got it. Someone I think else. that that's yeah. absolutely incredible. I think uh, you've done this topic justice. I do want to uh, recognize that this is a tough topic for our pet parents, and I do appreciate you all coming in. This is tough. We are going to lose- um, a member of our family. Unfortunately, this is the way mother nature works for us. And it does just makes it even harder because there is, they should be able to live a lot longer for the amount of love that they give us. So I definitely want to thank our pet parents for hanging in here on this tough topic. I know we have a few folks on here that have recently, there we go, thank you, have just recently lost um, a pet themselves. And I do want our pet parents to know whether you are a pet parent or a former pet parent, as you may have lost one, you are always welcome here. This is a place of love and we love our pets and we always want to learn about our pets. But I think Dr. Sheen has done an amazing job of helping us navigate tonight in this tough topic. So I want to personally thank you. And if you can, please show her the love in the chat because she's worked really hard um, so that we can do that. I also want to really bring forth that she is with Fuzzy. So while she is in practice, she also helps pet parents uh, through their telemedicine app. And I think that that is absolutely incredible. They are available 24 seven. It is available to all pet parents. So please, if you need help and cannot reach your own practice, that that is an option that you could be pursuing. I only said because I'm a big fan of their chief medical officer and their entire organization. And Dr. Gonzalez was with them uh, that was with us last week. So hopefully we're gonna have more folks on from Fuzzy. I really enjoy them. I think that they're highly informed on their topic. So we are in the process of coming up with some new topics. Send us a note, tell us what you want us to talk about. We, we promise to make another one fun, not so heavy, because I know this can, can be a lot, but please, please, please let us know what you'd like us to talk about. But what I would like to do is have everyone raise their glass for our final toast. And I kind of, I have my notes here because I actually wanted to bring back the note of exactly, exactly what Dr. Sheen said that our senior pets are the ones that give us the greatest amount of love. So 
Let's all love them back even harder and take them all on a snafari. Cheers, everybody. Cheers. I would be curious how you take a gerbil on a snafari. I mean, how fun would that be? Yeah, I'm sure they have little harnesses where you can punch I mean, come them. on. Could yeah, you imagine how cute would that be? For our bunny folks, take them on. I'm just saying. By the way, I think that'd be great. Y'all have a great evening. I appreciate you all coming. I appreciate supporting the Bridge Club. You guys have a good night. Thanks, everybody. Good night, and thank you so much. This has really helped me tremendously. Oh, okay. I'm so thank glad, you. Darnell. I'm so glad. I was thinking of you. Just thinking. Yes, I, I know, and it really okay. has. Because one top, one thing that was mentioned this topic was having a guilt feeling, and this has really helped me tremendously. Oh, I'm, tremendously. that makes me so happy. I can't, I can't express it any anymore. <laughs> then thank, thank you so much. Thank you. All right, guys, have a great night. Bye-bye. Bye now.